Hello. Hi, everyone. Good evening. And thank you for joining us in the midst of what is certainly a confusing, frustrating, and unnerving time. I'm Hannah Finland. I'm a freelance producer, current producing and engagement consultant for the, new, the Network of Ensemble Creators, uh -huh. and former associate director of conferences and fieldwide learning at Theater Communications Group. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I've had the privilege of spending time working in service of creating a healthier arts and culture community, and it's an honor to continue doing so in this moment of crisis. Before we go any further, I wanna thank my brilliant colleagues and co-conspirators, Nicole Brewer, Abigail Vega, and Anne-Marie Lonsdale. A truer group of advocates, advocates, artists, and friends would be hard to find. Their efforts, integrity, consistency, and good humor in this moment have just been absolutely incredible to witness. Um, I also need to thank our dear friends at HowlRound Theater Commons, including Vijay Matthew, who you'll hear from later on, J.D. Stokely and Thea Rogers, with whom we are so proud to collaborate in any capacity. HowlRound, if you don't know, has been leading the theater field in reimagining digital connectivity and gathering since its inception. And they really just embody what it means to be a justice-oriented, nimble and responsive, community-first organization. We love you, HowlRound. Feel free to shoot some love at HowlRound on the internet. Our ASL, uh, ASL interpreters, Chris Anciano Garcia and Barbie Parker Greenwater and captioning service from the National Captioning Institute are absolutely vital to this conversation. And we thank them for their amazing work. And finally, our brilliant group of facilitators and contributors, some of whom tonight's producers know well and others who were just introduced to us in the past few days and jumped on board without hesitation. These folks are leaders of great vision and wisdom and we will beam lots of gratitude their way throughout this call. So five days ago, Nicole Brewer, a theater artist and anti-racist facilitator, put out a call for solidarity building to her online community. She asked if anyone wanted to collaborate on a Zoom call to address how individual artists were going to weather this crisis financially. Resources began to show up on the Facebook thread and were quickly added to a crowdsourced Google Doc. As some of you know, that Google Doc became overwhelmed with editors making the depth of this crisis and its impact on freelancers incredibly clear. It was transitioned to a website, which has now seen nearly 250,000 unique viewers in over 150 countries. We continue to receive a daily stream of resource suggestions, and our hope is that this aggregator will lead folks to join pre-existing efforts for collective action, as well as to locate efforts that you can contribute to and find community within. Tonight's event, uh, it's our goal tonight to provide resources regarding some of the top issues and challenges individual artists are facing right now, as well as to create space for us to recognize one another in a moment where we need our networks more than ever. Our only ask to you is that you lean into this experiment along with us, with grace and with generosity. It's possible we won't get to every question and we won't be able to address every unique situation that has befallen our community as a result of this crisis, but we promise you we are going to do our best and we are committed to continuing to share resource online and creating space for discussion. The sharing, rest assured, does not stop tonight and we will all lift each other up as we go. So we're looking forward to your feedback after the call, after our presentations, as to what was helpful to you and what else you'd like to learn. And just so you know, you're in really good company. Roughly 700 viewers, and I think that's a low stat, we'll give you the, the official stat at the end, uh, are currently tuning in. So we invite you to tweet or post, write your name, tell us where you're listening in from, and hashtag artist resource, that's artist plural resource, and how round, H-O-W-L-R-O-U-N-D, and then tune in to those tags throughout. You can follow the thread to get a sense of who we are and where we are and what's going on with us. So I'm going to pass the mic to my colleagues and friends, Nicole Brewer and Viviana Vargas momentarily. But before I do, I'd like to remind you to text questions to our WhatsApp line, which you can do by going to the HowlRound listing for this event and clicking send message or by adding 1-917-686-3185 to your WhatsApp contacts and sending directly. Please try, if you can, to include the category for your question in all caps before you write it, just to help us stay organized when we get to the Q&A. We're reserving time for that Q&A after we hear from all contributors, but feel free to send questions as you have them as they come up. 
And if you're communicating anything else throughout the evening, whether it's kudos or feedback or resources or just general thoughts on your social isolation and quarantine, um, please post and tweet them publicly with the hashtags, again, hashtag artist resource and hashtag HowlRound. Um, so with that, and without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to the inimitable Nicole and Viviana. Hey, I'll take the, <laughs> the hey again. This is wild. Hey, Viv. Hello. <laughs> so grateful to be in space with you, facilitating this digital convenience. Yes. I see this this request. We're just a pause for a second. We see the request about an echo. Um, not sure how to headphones. Is this better? Is the echo still present? It's better. Okay. Better. <laughs> Thank you, DJ. Okay. Um, so I'm Nicole Brewer. Um, and I'm going to just take a moment, if we could, to do a land acknowledgement. And um, as we've gathered digitally, I want to be um, in solidarity with the indigeneity of the land and that particular practice around stolen people and stolen land. And so I'm going to be naming some of the indigenous peoples who the um, facilitators and panelists are gathered on. And then I'm gonna invite I have audio, but my video is frozen. We see and hear you. Mm, I'm frozen too. After I honor um, the indigeneity of the land by naming these indigenous tribes, I will in open the space and invite for the panelists to also um, say where they're calling in from and whose ancestral lands they're on. So starting with myself, Nicole Brewer, um, I am right now calling you from the ancestral homelands of the Yamasi and the Muskogee, also known as Savannah, Georgia. I'd also like to take a moment to just honor HowlRound and say on behalf of the staff of the HowlRound Theater Commons at Emerson College, they wish to respectfully acknowledge that their offices are situated on land stolen from its original holders, the Massachusetts and the Wampanoag people, and they wish to pay their respects to those people past, present, and future. And then on behalf of Avita, I want to name the Manticoc tribe in uh, Long Island. I now open it up to the panelists to say where they're calling in from. Imanaja Mashikuna, Nukaka Kichwa Shuti, Yurasapi, Nukaka Vipana Shuti Mikani. Hello, friends. My name in Kichwa is Yurasapi. My name is also Viviana. I'm calling from um, farther south than a lot of folks on the call, I think, from Bogota, Colombia, with over 100 recognized tribes and groups, including Achagua, Embera, Wayu, Kipaishani. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lori Goldstein. I'm an employment lawyer in Chicago, Illinois. And I'm Jan Feldman. I'm the executive director of Lawyers for the Creative Arts in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I'm Ijema Oluo, and I am a writer and speaker in the Seattle area, uh, Duwamish territory. This is Claudia Alec, executive producer, calling up justice, calling in from the territory of the Ohlone peoples. The people are still alive. 
This is Lori Baskin from Theater Communications Group, working remotely from northern Westchester on the lands of the Lenape and Wappinger. I'm Carl okay. T. Swanson. Swanson. I'm the Associate Director at Springboard for the Arts, calling from Minnesota, which is the homeland of the Dakota and Ojibwe peoples. I'm Carrie Cleveland from Surf Plus, the Education Outreach Manager. I'm calling from Montpelier, Vermont, and we are on the land of the Wabanaki Confederacy and the Abenaki. This is Rita calling from Washington, D.C., which sits on the ancestral lands of the Anacostans, whose descendants belong to the Biscataway peoples. Amy Smith calling from Philadelphia, which is Lenny Lenape land. Brian Herrera calling from Princeton, New Jersey, also in the Lenny Lenape, Lenny Lenape ancestral lands. Anne-Marie Lonsdale calling from Oakland, California, which is Ohlone land. Anna Fedlin calling from Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is Pueblo land. This is Abigail Vega. I'm calling, calling in from Coahuitecan lands, which is now known to some as San Antonio, Texas. Beautiful. So I invite just us to take a breath and then I'll turn it over to Viv. Yes, thank you for um, I also wanted to, well, we wanted to just um, quote, um, paraphrase a little bit for time. Um, another part of the land acknowledgement written by Adrian Wong of Spiderweb Show um, in Ontario with from an event in partnership with HowlRound as well that is done digitally. Um, and I think just to, to kind of frame what we're working on um, here. So, and since our activities are shared digitally to the internet, let's also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art we are here to talk about leave significant carbon footprints contributing to changing climates that are disproportionately affecting indigenous peoples worldwide. Um, I invite you to join me in acknowledging all of this as we as, as, as shared as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. Um, and I think also thinking about our situation right now as well and what we're talking about um, in relation to indigenous communities in the US and, and across the world. Thank you, Viv. And so I wanna talk about technology and the technological lags that can happen when you are meeting digitally. And so in order for our connection that we're building not to be interrupted when a lag happens, I would invite you all to just do a body scan if the video freezes, right? To see where the last thing that you heard is set, is like sitting with you, um, to ask that part of your body to release. Um, or you could do something just in terms of just writing down the last thing that you heard. Whatever it is, we're asking that you stay present for this time that we've gathered together instead of allowing aggravation or anxiety or other feelings to bubble up when the technology isn't performing as it would if we were in person. Great. And along with that, um, if you are writing and taking notes, or if not, I invite us all to take a moment to self-reflect, um, perhaps set intentions for our time together um, these next few hours. Um, I would love to ask you to reflect, maybe write down these um, on a sheet of paper. What would you like to take with you, promote, uplift in these next two hours together? What would you like to take with you, bring forth, 
um, what is your intention for, for this time together? And then also um, on the flip side, what would you like to let go of? What do you not want to take with you into this time? Um, and later on, I think we can even expand out after the call. And I'd love to quote Rena Wolf of 11th Social, who shared with me these prompts yesterday, actually, um, and kind of really go well with what I was planning for us here. What are you ready to let go of? And what would you like to be poured into you? So yeah, just inviting us into this call to take um, a moment to set intentions into all this information we're about to receive and process and share. And so I just wanna also come in and say that the links to resources are going to be tweeted out by HowlRound. So, um, you know, please check Twitter for that digital information as well. And then we want to move into, um, you know, can I hand it over to you, Viv, around this Reflective Five? Sure, we can mute. Um, so throughout the call in between each of the speakers, we'll be uh, taking just a breath basically in between each to be able to fully receive and accept all the information we're getting, um, allow us to be full and then um, be ready to receive the next speaker um, in, in um, the, the most way that, the best way we can. So uh, this these moments of kind of reflection of, of communal breaths we'll be taking together um, are to do that and also to take a moment to reflect on the specific communities that we're here to support in terms of freelance artists. So we'll be naming um, specific marginalized communities that we want to uplift into the space. And for each of these communities, there are additional resources, as Nicole said, that will be uh, named at the end in terms of different GoFundMe fundraisers or um, places you can donate or support um, with your time. So we'll start off um, reflecting specifically right now. Love to take a moment. Disabled freelance artists. We want to uplift in this space, um, reflect, and go forth. So I'd love for us to take a, a breath, a communal breath together. We'll inhale on five, hold for five, and release for five. And also, you know, you're welcome to do this however is comfortable for you. So inhale, one, two, three, four, five. Hold, five, four, three, two, one. Release, five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. Thank you, Viv, for that practice. So now we're gonna hand it off to Evita, who will lead us in our first section on legal advocacy advice for freelance artists. And note that when, um, again, we as panelists cite a resource, it'll be tweeted out vis-a-vis -vis how around. So look for it there. Evita? Hi, everyone. Um, well, first, I want to thank you all for tuning in and listening tonight. And I really want to thank the organizers for taking time uh, to put this together as a resource for uh, supporting all the artists and freelancers that are affected. And I want to first start by saying here tonight that um, I'm here to, uh, to be a support, but of course, this is not legal advice and I can't uh, give legal advice tonight. Um, but I'm here to talk a little bit about contracts and the various uh, provisions that may be affecting you during this time and the work that you do. So uh, we can talk today about some negotiation points that are helpful for you and what you're doing and uh, might be useful moving forward. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about why this is uh, becoming a, an issue right now. So a lot of companies and organizations now are struggling to keep up with the uh, evolving landscape that is relating to the employment 
uh, issues right now. So they're having a hard time making decisions about whether events can actually legally happen at this particular time. So in New York, for instance, uh, Cuomo just Thursday announced a ban on gatherings of uh, 500 people or more across the state um, for the foreseeable future. So it's not clear to us when that will end, if it will end. And the CDC uh, just today, I believe, just urged a na nationwide halt uh, about um, gatherings for more than 50 people for at least the next eight weeks. So this is, of course, leaving many uh, arts organizations uh, in flux about whether or not they should be postponing events, um, canceling events, and um, we're now trying to uh, make decisions about which uh, personnel needs to be on site, who can work from home, who can't work from home, and uh, organizations are trying to make decisions about their obligations with independent contractors and freelancers, uh, about their programming and what needs to happen. So that being said, uh, how does this affect arts, uh, the artists, freelancers from a legal perspective? Uh, so the first thing I think freelancers need to know is that they are protected in New York by the Freelance Isn't Free Act. And I do believe that we could tweet out uh, some information about that act. Um, if you are a freelancer in New York City, you are protected by the Freelance Isn't Free Act. And it is, uh, it is something that was passed in 2017. And freelancer services are sometimes commonly referred to as moonlighting, consulting, uh, subcontracting, contracting, um, gigs, projects, uh, many different things. Um, and it essentially uh, protects freelancers, right? So that freelancers have the right to a few things. So I'm gonna go through the act a little bit today so that you have an understanding of what it protects you from and what you have the rights to. So uh, essentially, um, all contracts that are worth $800 or more have to be in writing. So this includes all agreements between you and whoever hired you that equal $800 at one time or that are worth $800 within a four month period or 120 days. So the written contract must spell out the work that you are performing and it must show what exactly you are being paid for the work and how you will be paid and when you will be paid. And you must keep a copy of that contract and the person or the entity that is hiring you must also keep a copy of that contract. And if it does not actually include the hiring date or the uh, payment date, then they must pay you within 30 days of the day that you complete the work. Uh, and if they don't come, uh, comply with that law and they're in violation, then there's many different ways that you can try to remedy that. Um, you could try to resolve it informally by talking to them and then putting a contract in place. You could speak directly with the hiring party about it, or there's also other tools. You can go to the Office of Labor Policy Standards and there's actually a complaint process. You can actually file a civil action in court or you can do a combination of that. So that's one way to go about it. And if, if you don't actually live in New York, there are other states that have similar laws, but they're not the uh, Freelance Isn't Free Act. And I do believe California may be enacting something similar or they have. So it would be worthwhile to look into that. Um, so next, after that, we can talk about what's called the force majeure and cancellation clauses in your contract. And you've probably been uh, hearing about this quite a bit uh, since the entire um, coronavirus uh, epidemic or pandemic as it's called now. Um, so if you do have an agreement for your services right now, uh, your hiring party uh, may be talking to you about uh, the force majeure language. And so what does that mean? It sounds really uh, fancy. In French, it means superior force, right? So it's a common um, contract clause that has the intention to uh, free both parties from the liability or the obligation of performing the contract when something happens that is like beyond the actual um, reasonable uh, intention or control of the parties. So usually, um, that's something like an epidemic. So if, for, if, if it's helpful, a real life uh, situation, if you entered into a contract with somebody and you couldn't have possibly foreseen something like an epidemic, then it excuses you from performing and it excuses the other party from paying you for performing because it's not possible for uh, you to have expected something like this to occur. And that's what a force majeure clause is supposed to address. The intention is to protect both parties from any kind of 
obligation from arising. So it's supposed to cover events and circumstances like war, strike, riot, act of government or an act of God or an epidemic or pandemic like coronavirus that prevents you from actually performing your contract. So I suggest that if you do have a contract, you take a look at your contract to see if it does have a force majeure clause in there to see if you're covered or if, uh, or if it exists. And if it does, usually um, it should say exactly what it covers. And if it does indeed cover an epidemic like the coronavirus, um, it's supposed to be construed very, very narrowly and it's not always a total release from the hiring party paying you. Um, so if you have prepaid fees or expenses, certain things that can be negotiated and excluded, then uh, you may be able to still recover some money even though there's a force majeure clause. So I would just read it uh, very carefully to see exactly what it covers. Um, I will note that uh, oftentimes force majeure clauses include what's called an act of government. Um, and here um, the act of government um, in New York has effectively made it impracticable to perform um, many acts of government for the performance. So um, uh, this is a real life event of your child actually coming. So supporting that. Yay. Yes. Sorry guys, this literally just happened. Um, it's like no apologies. real life. Um, so um, sometimes um, active government is, is a called a force majeure event. And when that happens, it's actually um, covered because New York actually shut down. So in instances like that, um, it, it will stop the contract from being something that needs to be performed. So in instances like that, um, unfortunately, um, sorry, I'm going to try to put her down. Um, uh, you will want to um, make sorry. <laughs> You'll want to uh, just double check your force majeure clause. Um, the other thing to um, take a look at are cancellation clauses. Uh, sometimes in agreements there are cancellation clauses that allows both parties to end the contract as long as certain terms can be met. Um, so in that in those cases, I do encourage you to check your uh, you check your cancellation clause to see if they're relevant for you. Um, so my advice to freelancers at this point, um, if you do have multiple multiple event contracts with your hiring party um, or a third party or venue, understand how canceling these events or contracts will impact future events. Um, consider working things out for the longer run. So for example, discuss the possibility of postponement. Um, ask for payment now. So if there are uh, out-of-pocket expenses, for example, that you've incurred, ask for those payments now because they may, they may be interested in continuing that relationship with you or they may be interested in crediting you now for a future gift because if you've had a long-standing relationship, they might be interested in that. Um, but make sure whatever you do, put everything leading up to this event in writing, especially conversations related to this contract and the arrangement. Um, I am not, unfortunately, a labor attorney, and so I cannot uh, speak too much to filing for unemployment. Um, I do believe we have another attorney online who, who does work in that field, so she may be able to speak a little bit more intelligently on it. But I do know that unemployment insurance is temporary income for eligible workers um, who lose their jobs through no fault of their own. So um, you may be um, you may be eligible for it, but you must be uh, ready, willing, and able to work and actively looking for work during the uh, week, each week that you are claiming for the benefits and that those do, who do qualify can, we, uh, can receive a weekly benefit for up to 26 full weeks during a one-year period. Um, and I, I think uh, there's another attorney on the line who may be able to speak a little bit more intelligently to that, to that and answer questions a little bit later. So um, thank you guys so much for having me and for inviting me to speak on such an important topic at such an important time. Thank you so much. So appreciative of you and your multitasking, right? Really no <laughs> apologies. That's what it is to be in a community and to thank be you. supporting one another, you know? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> So I wanted to see if any other lawyers wanted to chime in just now before we head forward. So I want to pause for that. Let some folks unmute themselves if they want. Okay. Lori Goldstein, did you want to chime in at this moment? Hi, it's Lori. 
Can you hear me? I can hear you. Sorry, I, I couldn't find you guys for a minute. Um, yes, I'm an employment lawyer. I can talk about uh, unemployment, although it is state specific. So it really depends on your state unemployment laws. But most of them are pretty similar uh, and do provide for up to 26 weeks. In terms of the COVID situation, if you've been diagnosed as, as being infected or you have to stay home to, to take care of a spouse, a parent or a child who has it, um, or because there's any government imposed quarantine, then you are, would be considered covered by unemployment and they will waive, at least in, in most states, they will waive the requirement that you be seeking work and certifying every week that you're looking for work because you're basically waiting for, if you're in a current situation, you're waiting for your employer um, to resume your employment. So you don't have to keep looking for other work. However, you can't just quit your job because you're concerned about the disease. You can't just quit your job um, because you feel like you have to stay home um, with a child. Um, that would not be considered a, a, a reason attributable to the employer. Uh, but under the new federal law, if it's passed, uh, depending on the Senate, there may be extended benefits um, that would apply to having to be home because of uh, school closures. Thank you so much for jumping in, um, Lori. I appreciate that. We just sure. were tending to the community needs. Wasn't necessarily on the agenda that way. So I so appreciate you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And so now we'd like to transition on to Claudia. Oh, okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Um, I don't see my video up, but I'm just going to keep talking and you let me know if I'm doing all right. So I'm going to be talking just a little bit very quickly about some uh, best practices for uh, moving your work um, or your gathering to online spaces. So my work is transmedia. And when I use the term transmedia, I'm using it to talk about work that is living in physically embodied space as well as in digital space. Um, it's an extension of the narrative, not a replacement of the narrative, um, and it can be um, it can be experienced in asynchronous way or in a live way. So it can be live streaming, or it can perhaps be content that um, people can enjoy uh, throughout time. And I give an example of New Paradise Laboratories. Look at the work that they're doing. Uh, they have a really great practice that sort of mixes um, work that lives in a digital space as well as work that lives in the physical space. Um, Another example of uh, organ uh, of projects that I've worked on, um, you should talk to people who do international development. I did a project called Shakespeare Iraq, where I collaborated with artists in Iraq, and we communicated through video conferencing software. At that time, it was Skype, which was great for one-on-one -on -one conversations. And then we did crowdsourced fundraising. So they created a video, we put it up on Indiegogo, and that's how we raised the money for that. So I'm talking about things that many of us are already aware of and familiar with. Another example of this type of work is uh, something that I did in 2018 uh, with uh, the Protest Plays Project, and it was called Hashtag Theater Action Gun Control. So my way of supporting that project, I took a short play by Idris Goodwin. I uh, asked him for permission to share it widely. Um, he said, yes, I shared it with a bunch of folks, and I said, please share this in any digital format that you would like to. And one person took this digital play and created a Twitter account for it. And each tweet was a line from the play. Another person just did a simple YouTube video, one camera right in front of the computer, so easy to do. Um, another company, I think it was company one in Boston, they actually did something pre pretty cool that was like black and white. It had a couple of different shots. They added some, some background music. And then another group of students, it was about 20 students in the classroom and they just sat down and somebody recorded it with their cell phone. So there's a lot of different ways to create this work and share this work. Um, 
Um, I would also recommend that you uh, reach out to the disabled community. My own practice has been one where I've been using digital and mixed formats for, for years and years because it allows me to collaborate across space and time nationally. But for the past two years, I have been deeply investing in the disabled community and disabled practices for as much accessibility as possible, specifically because sometimes I can't physically get to a space. Um, I I have been doing a project with Mia Amir, and I'm realizing I didn't put his name down here in the notes, but his name is Rue Delesson, I believe is his name. And they've been doing a project called Unsettling Dramaturgy. We've been meeting for about a year online, and it is a group that is a mix of Crip and Indigenous dramaturgs. Um, I'll provide a link that will allow you to see some of the ways we've been gathering dramaturgically uh, through video. Um, again, I just recommend that you, you experiment um, and also learn from what other people have done. When you're gathering online, the planning process is going to be different. You're going to need more planning because you won't have the shortcut language that we've been creating for so many years. You're going to need to uh, have more um, uh, communication and confirmation of people being able to access what you're doing and also familiarity or uh, yeah familiarity with those platforms so focus on the goal of your gathering and then design the ways to reach that goal your platform is only as successful as your community's ability to use it so sometimes you're going to have to slow your process down and perhaps do a session that's just people playing with the platform. We have to remember that uh, we all have different access to uh, technology. Some of us are in regions where the internet is not as strong. Um, some of us don't have the same kind of technological equipment. So we're all going to be using what we have. Um, the last thing I wanna say before I let go this go is you need to keep creating income. So I have colleagues who busk on Twitter and they, they do a Twitter thread and they have a bunch of clever things in it or they do some fun um, activities on Instagram and then they have their cash app or their Venmo app. That's a way to get income. You can start a Patreon account and share your content in that way. Uh, you can also you know, have a YouTube channel and get sponsorship, but there's a lot of different ways for you to be able to have your audience support your work as you're sharing it in these digital ways. Um, I'm going to pass the mic to Brian Herrera now. Um, just before we do that, yes. thank you so much, Claudia. I so appreciate you. Um, I just want to take a, a second to also do a reflective five around Asian Americans. Would you please? Just that moment. Yeah. Yes. Asian American freelance artist reflective five. And so I invite you to inhale. One, two, three, four, five. Hold. Five, four three, two, one, release, one, two, three, four, five. Brian? Hello, I'm activating my video in a moment. So thank you so much. I'm grateful to, my name is Brian Herrera, uh, he, him, his plus, and I'm grateful to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to join this conversation. I should say at the outset that I didn't arrive with any particular resources or techniques to offer. Rather, um, I really just hope to lift something to keep in mind as we proceed in these uncertain times. I work between two industries, <clears throat> higher education and the nonprofit theater. And over the last 10 days or so, I've marveled at how passionately my colleagues in both sectors have leapt into the uncertainty of these dizzying days, how they have worked with intelligence and humanity and creativity to engage the myriad problems that this shutdown has caused. But this should be no surprise. This is exactly what principled teachers, engaged theater makers, and humane administrators do. We work within often rigid limitations to create opportunities for others, especially for others to come together so that they can access transformative experiences. But even as I've marveled at this extraordinary generosity, usually from the peculiar social distance that is social media, I've also observed a particular predisposition, a habit, a bias, as it has emerged again and again. We are often holding, those of us who are often new to this, to this kind of work, are often holding tight to the promised comforts of what Claudia referenced briefly as the synchronous when we must also engage the realities of the asynchronous. What do I mean by this? 
a synchronous model of engagement is what in some ways those of us right here hearing my voice right now are doing. Get folks gathering together at the same time in the shared space of a particular venue to engage a common experience. An asynchronous model is what will happen when folks return to the recording of this call to access this particular conversation sometime in the near or distant future. Neither mode is necessarily better or worse, but they are distinct. And in our enthusiasm to take our work online, we must remain alert to the real differences between synchronous and asynchronous modes of engagement if we are to sustain ourselves and our communities through this as yet indefinite shutdown. Remember, I speak as a college professor working in an industry that for the first time is shifting abruptly and en masse to online or remote instruction. With just a few days warning, thousands upon thousands of college instructors are moving their classes and the working conditions of hundreds of thousands of students to remote online platforms. Indeed, Zoom University is already a somewhat snarky trending hashtag. Yet Zoom is not a place, it's a tool. And just as we would not presume that a carefully crafted touring performance could move from one venue to another without a thorough investigation of both the new limits and different opportunities of each successive venue, so too must we be intentional when we adapt our existing creative practices, which so often prioritize the synchronous rewards of convening and shared time and space as we move them to online platforms. Many of us on this call, if only for the last handful of minutes, are somewhat familiar with the limits of purportedly interactive real-time platforms like Zoom. Glitches of connectivity and signal strength, um, echoes, learning curves as folks accustom themselves or sometimes don't bother to, to the limitations of the platform, et cetera, the list goes on. Yet, as this call also demonstrates, platforms like Zoom can be extraordinary tools when used to connect collaborators to engage specific tasks in somewhat real time. But it's not a plug and play process. You can't just press go or press zoom and expect a synchronous session like this one to stream seamlessly. It inevitably requires that some or many of the collaborators also engage a me measure of usually asynchronous preparation for the encounter. This is quite simply what I'm here to preach. As we rush to solve this new problem, as we rush to share our skills, to figure out how to make this work and how to make it work well, we must think rigorously yet creatively uh, about whether synchronous or asynchronous tools are best suited for our particular tasks. Speaking personally, I've opted to forego synchronous instruction for the remainder of my spring semester choosing uh, to prioritize instead a constellation of asynchronous tools like rebooting my own public facing podcast, ha having students commenting independently on public facing platforms like the new play exchange, while reserving synchronous tools like Zoom for class project meetings and individual or small group consultations. This is how I feel these tools are best used to serve the particular project of my courses this semester. Indeed, Amidst the many disparate pressures of this complicated time, it is on each of us to assess the tools available to us and to make our own decisions about which tools are best for our particular tasks, and also to advocate for and support our colleagues in strategizing their best way or forward. The pressures of this moment might be encouraging us to go ahead, just move everything, to stream online. And I'm here to say, to make sure there's at least one voice in the crowd that says yes, Use synchronous online tools as you feel they serve and sustain your practice, but stay alert to other, perhaps more asynchronous tools that might be as useful as sustaining. We are looking toward a time of brisk discovery, one that will present as yet unknown challenges. So I'm here to say that as we might be inclined to just move everything online, uh, balance here as in everything, balance is essential, thanks. And I'm turning it over to Vijay. Thank you, Brian. Vijay, Vijay, are you there? All right. So um, we are going, I'm going to turn this over. I'm going to be quiet, turn it over to Viv. 
yes, I think we are gonna move on and maybe go back if, if we get DJ. But uh, another reflective um, breath. And we'd like to um, center, uplift trans freelance artists, specifically trans freelance artists of color um, for this one. So we can go ahead and inhale. One, two, three, four, five. Hold, five, four, three, two, one. Release, five, four, three, two, one. And now we're gonna move into um, discussing support and awareness re-national advocacy efforts, starting um, with Kida, I'll pass it over. Guida. Guida? Yeah. Guida. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you for including me in this vital conversation. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share what resources I can with you. Uh, though the National Endowment for the Arts primarily funds organizations, many members of our program staff, including myself, have worked as freelancers at some point in our careers. We know that there are more than 5 million Americans who make their livelihoods in the broader arts and culture sector nationwide, and individual artists and freelancers are particularly vulnerable at this time. My fiance is an actor and a visual artist, so finding ways to support individuals are always on my mind now more than ever. We are here to support you in any way that we can. First, I want to make sure that those of you in the literary arts know about the few grants that we still have available for individual artists. We offer creative writing fellowships for career development and translation project grants for writers seeking to translate literary works from other languages into English. The deadlines for these programs are in January and March of every year, and I encourage you to go to our website, arts.gov, to learn more. Second, I want to encourage each of you to go to your regional arts organizations your state arts agencies, and to your local arts agencies to seek support. As mandated by Congress, 40% of the arts endowments budget goes to state arts agencies each year, and many of them have individual artist grants. The development of emergency grant programs for individual artists who have lost work due to this extraordinary situation is underway at some of these agencies. Their staff members are there to help you. So even though it can be intimidating, I encourage you to reach out to them. You can go to the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies to find their state and regional arts agencies directory. Americans for the Arts has a local arts agency dashboard that might be a helpful search tool for local arts agencies in your area. There are thousands nationwide and you can find those agencies that are recent grantees on the National Endowment for the Arts website. <laughs> Third, the National Endowment for the Arts is always looking for a grant review for grant review panelists, and we are making a special effort to engage freelancers in panel service at this time. Panelists are compensated for their, their service. We do have a lot of criteria to meet regarding the composition of our grant review panels. But if you would like to learn more, you can email me at maydalo at arts.gov. That's M-A-E-D-E-L-O at arts.gov. I also wanted to share that the Families First Coronavirus Response Act that was before the Senate today does include some provisions that might assist individual artists, including individual tax credits for sick and family leave for self-employed individuals and additional emergency funding to states for unemployment compensation. Lori Baskin from Theater Communications Group will share more details. Emergency funding, particularly 
for artists of, or arts organizations has not yet been a part of any federal relief package, but some of you might be eligible for the disaster assistance loans for small businesses impacted by COVID-19 from the Small Business Administration if you operate as an LLC or a nonprofit. While the National Endowment for the Arts staff are not permitted to abdicate for ourselves or on behalf of our agency, we do have the ability to inform Congress. Our senior leadership is actively working to make sure our contacts are aware of the reality of how the coronavirus pandemic is impacting the arts and entertainment industries in all 50 states, in the US territories, and in every congressional district in the nation, including freelance workers and individual artists. We are collecting facts, testimonials, and sharing ways sector-specific relief might be able to help. We want to hear from you so um, we can share your story. Please never hesitate to reach out to me, even if you want to talk. Again, please feel free to email me at maydello at arts.gov. That's M-A-E-D-E-L-O at arts.gov. I appreciate your patience uh, as this is a particularly high volume time for staff at the National Endowment for the Arts which of course has been exacerbated by this crisis, but I promise I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Um, and because I forgot to introduce myself when I first started talking, I'll do it now. I'm Wida Maydell. I'm a theater and musical theater specialist at the National Endowment for the Arts, she, her, hers, and I look forward to being in touch with anybody who wants to be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wida. Lori Baskin. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Yes, I'm Lori Baskin. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Lori, yes, go on. Good, good. Go good. On. All right. I'm Director of Research Policy and Collective Action at the Theater Communications Group, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm very grateful to be included in this webinar and to connect with all of you, though I do want to acknowledge what a trying and uncertain time this is. TCG has tried to move very quickly to respond to and even anticipate some of the needs of the field. We held a webinar on March 6th, and I think that that uh, link will be tweeted out. Panelists included Paul Christie from Oregon Shakespeare Festival, sharing their emergency resources and experience as a result of the wildfires that happened out west. Several people from Starkweather and Shepley Insurance Brokerage lend, uh, lent some experience uh, as to insurance coverage and other issues. Dr. Charles Nolan, a husband of a theater trustee and himself an epidemiologist, joined the call. Molly Quinlan Hayes from Arts Ready joined us, and of course, as did Greg Reiner from the NEA. There was a lot of good information on that call, and it is posted online on the TCG circle, um, so you'll get that link. TCG has also assembled a list of resources. I think so have we all, but ours is there. It is posted on the TCG circle, and we hope that will be helpful. On the advocacy front, TCG is a founding member of the Performing Arts Alliance and closely collaborates with a number of other national performing arts service organizations through that coalition. We also participate as a member of the Cultural Advocacy Group, and so we are in regular contact with the broader arts advocacy community at the federal level. Last Wednesday, TCG sent an action alert synchronized with other sister organizations. This alert focused on the opportunity that, as Congress and the administration considered some form of federal economic assistance, theaters and theater artists were urged to speak up to ensure that any federal relief package would include the entire nonprofit arts sector. That action alert is still open, and to date, nearly 900 people have generated over 2,800 messages to Capitol Hill. That is quite powerful, and it breaks all records. If you are interested in signing up to receive TCG Action Alerts, please visit tcg.org, view the drop-down menu under Advocacy, and click Action Alerts. You'll find the link to sign up at the top of that page. This past Saturday, I sent another Action Alert that included some information about what the House passed relief package included, and I'll share that with you now, though uh, 
several pieces of this have been referenced um, by Lori and then by Wida just now, but here's what I take to be the full range of what's in this package that is also now before the Senate. Mandated emergency paid leave for employees for qualified sick leave, family med and medical leave, and to care for a child whose school has closed. Refundable payroll tax credits for required emergency paid leave provided by employers with fewer than 500 employees and nonprofits are eligible for relief. Refundable individual tax credits for leave taken by self-employed workers, that's most of you, I think, for qualified sick leave, caring for a family member, or caring for a child whose school has closed. Emergency funding to states for unemployment compensation and additional provisions related to nutrition assistance and cost-free coronavirus testing provisions for the uninsured. We do not expect that this will be the only federal aid package related to coronavirus. This was a very quick package meant to address certain issues. We are very hopeful uh, and expect that there will be another stimulus package, more like the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act that was passed back in 2009. TCG will join with other federal uh, art service organizations to advocate for the arts and individual artists to be eligible for any such stimulus package. Toward that end, TCG has also distributed a survey to member theaters to gather information about the impact of the coronavirus on their operations, and it also includes questions related to individual artists. So far, we have responses from about 50 theaters out of our 500, and we'll keep pushing for more. The most important tool for us in our advocacy work is your stories. We know that the impact of the current environment will deeply affect individual artists. Please share your stories with me. I will add that information to our advocacy efforts, and I'm sharing my email address, lbaskin at tcg.org. L for Lori, Baskin like the ice cream, L-B-A-S-K-I-N at tcg.org. And we're all in this together. Thank you for having me tonight and to the organizers. Um, this is a great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori Baskin. I just want to drop in and one, breathe. <laughs> to say, hey, we as freelancers, this is a moment for us to repurpose um, our hustle skills, our promoting skills, and our marketing skills to advocacy skills. We have to advocate for ourselves on a personal level. Um, we have to advocate on a citywide level. We have to advocate on a state level, and we have to advocate um, on a national level. And when I say have to, I don't use those words like lightly. I really mean that we are an invisibilized population and we have to do the work of making sure that people know what this impact is um, and what our value is in this moment. So I wanted to drop in and share that. And as we move to our next session, section, excuse me, we'll take a time for a reflective five. And this time we wanna center indigenous freelance artists and so an inhale, one, two, three, four, five, hold, five, four, three, two, one, exhale, one, two, three, four, five. And Marie, I'm calling you forward. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Anne-Marie Lonsdale. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I'm a consultant and arts worker with a background in theater, dance, experimental live performance, producing and presenting. 
and in artist services, grant making, and professional development for individual artists and small companies. So I think that's a lot of the folks on this call tonight. Um, you might notice that many of us um, who are facilitating tonight are theater artists or adjacent to the performance field. And that's true, that's how we know each other, but we are working diligently to find and share resources for artists in all disciplines. Um, so we hope that you will be patient with us as we recognize that bias that we have and work towards um, identifying and sharing resource for artists in all different fields. Tonight, we wanted to share some ideas and information about emergency funding for independent artists, for folks who need support immediately or who need support while they sort out government benefits from state and federal government, as Lori just described. We wanna give you a sense of the landscape of possibilities for you moving forward. And Wida has already shared some amazing ideas about public funding, which is so helpful, thank you. Please keep in mind that you need to work with your tax professionals to understand the income implications of any grants or funding that you receive. And as a rule, we encourage folks to set aside 20 to 25% of any income that they receive from a grant or fellowship um, to cover federal, state, and local tax. Um, and that those taxes are not the same as paying into unemployment or paying into dis the disability fund in your particular state or locality. We don't have time tonight to get deep into these details of self-employment tax practice and law. Uh, so I'm gonna encourage you to contact your lawyer or accountant and ask them specific questions about your specific situation. They can give you that individualized advice. And if you don't have access to those types of services, let us know and we can try to make some recommendations. Um, there are a number of, um, volunteer lawyer for the arts um, organizations listed on our site. And um, we can try to make other resources available um, in the coming weeks. And we're also hoping to organize uh, another webinar on the topic um, in, a, in the coming days. Please also know that when you are applying for emergency funding, you typically need to have some kind of documentation, such as contracts or receipts, in order to prove that you lost income and incurred expenses that, um, for which you need to be reimbursed. You will also probably want to have an artist resume or website or both, um, which substantiates your artistic practice. And another best practice is that we want to encourage you to read the guidelines for each funding opportunity that you apply for carefully and be reasonable about what might apply to you. But first and foremost, we want you to know that you are not alone and that many amazing and resourceful people in the field care deeply about what's happening to our freelancer and artist communities. And these are folks working in all disciplines, working towards solutions. And we are gonna talk about some of them presently. Um, it's important to understand that many foundations and even some government agencies are prohibited by their nonprofit charters from dispersing funds to individual artists. And so they have to give funds away through intermediaries, smaller nonprofits, local arts councils, re-grantors, service organizations. So I'm going to encourage you to look at agencies that already give funds to individual artists first. Now we're gonna hear from a few of those. Um, and we have several amazing organizations that make emergency grants and are making emergency grants in direct response to COVID-19. And first up, I'd like to invite Carl Swanson from Springboard for the Arts in Minnesota. Hello, um, my name is Carlos T.S. Swanson. Thanks so much for having me today. Uh, I use the he, him, his pronouns. Uh, I'm Associate Director at Springboard for the Arts, and Springboard is an artist-led community and economic development organization that's based in Fergus Falls in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, we do our work in and around Minnesota and nationally share resources and consult. 
And our work is about cultivating vibrant communities by connecting artists with the resources they need to make a living and a life. And in this moment, one of the resources that artists need is direct cash assistance to cover lost income from this wave of cancellations that we're seeing from the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we at Springboard, we have a long-standing personal emergency relief fund that we're expanding to meet this moment in this crisis. The fund offers up to $500 in short-term relief and is limited to artists in Minnesota. I'm sharing what we do as a model for others. We fielded so many information requests about our program over the last five days. And so for our part, we operate on the broadest definitions of who is an artist and we're working to meet the immediate needs of the artists in our community as we plan for the future. Uh, when we announced the expansion of our emergency relief fund on Thursday last week, uh, Springboard initially transferred $10,000 uh, from our reserves and budget to support this effort. And within the first three days of launching the coronavirus response fund, we've had over 130 requests from artists. So we launched this fundraiser to expand up that pool and keep funding more requests. We're, we expect requests to keep on going up as this continues on, and we're going to keep on fundraising to meet that demand. Springboard's not taking any overhead from the fundraiser. It's being di distributed directly to artists. And for us, we have an internal review process, and then we're working to get funds out as quickly and directly as possible. So that's both the scary uh, in that enormous need and the heartening in that people are stepping up and we're activating uh, and we're actively fundraising to bring in more partners and donors to support artists and contractors and freelancers and creative workers. And an emergency relief fund is a way to meet those immediate needs of artists and creative workers in the short term of this crisis. Um, but it's also a real time survey of the kinds of work being lost and the financial impacts that are being caused by this disruption. Uh, and as, as we've heard from other speakers, uh, we're in a moment where we need, to advocate, we need to advocate for independent contractors and creative workers and really bring that population forward. So this is valuable data that we're working with as, at this moment as we advocate for structural change and support for artists. And we're working to be able to share those stories and get them out so that we're working uh, with our advocacy partners. And just because it's critical to the long-term recovery of the creative sector that creative workers, contractors, and freelancers are included in all federal, state, and local relief efforts, whether that's through employment uninsurance, tax credits, cash assistance, student debt, or mortgage payment suspension, or other mechanisms. Uh, the amount lost in contract cancellation, cancellations, especially with the work in the service and retail industry drying up, it runs easily into the hundreds of millions of dollars, and that's more than any one donor or organization or foundation can do. So uh, even so, emergency relief is critical now as we organize for what's next. We have to do both at the same time. We've gotten a lot of requests about our program and we're finalizing a quick and dirty uh, so you want to start an emergency relief fund toolkit. And we'll, when we have it, it'll be up at our website at springboardforthearts.org slash coronavirus. So that's what we're doing on the ground here and building for what's next. Thanks for having me. You can reach me at Carl at springboardforthearts.org and all of our resources um, are being collected at springboardforthearts.org slash coronavirus. Thank you so much, Carl. We really appreciate you. Now I'd like to invite Carrie Cleveland from Surf Plus. Thank you everyone for your time. Um, thank you to HowlRound and all of the people who mobilized so quickly to create this live stream. Um, my name is Carrie Cleveland. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager at Surf Plus. Um, on behalf of the organization, I'm honored to be included. For those of you who don't know us, um, Surf Plus, the Artist Safety Net, is a national artist service organization that is dedicated to helping artists build strong and resilient careers, and we're focused on emergency readiness, response, and recovery. Surf Plus is the go-to organization for studio-based artists on readiness with information resources and education programs. We are an advocate for the needs of artists working with the general emergency management community and the federal government to ensure that their programs include artists and other self-employed workers. Surf Plus has, and its founding mission is, an emergency relief fund for artists working in craft disciplines facing career-threatening emergencies. So here's how we are responding to the COVID-19 outbreak and what you can access through us. There are emergency and recovery resources for artists 
designed for studio-based artists, but really relevant to artists in all disciplines on risk management and continuity planning. We are linking to those and any additional resources through the COVID-19 banner on our homepage at surfplus.org. And that's C-E-R-F-P-L-U-S dot O-R-G. And our website is included in the freelancers resources page. We're mobilizing our advocacy network and working nationally to help artists gain access to federal resources like those through the Small Business Administration and the FEMA Other Needs Assistance Program and connecting artists with those resources as they become available. We're launching the Surf Plus COVID-19 Relief Fund, which joins our existing emergency relief funds. This particular fund will support artists working in craft disciplines such as glass, wood, ceramics, fiber, and metal who require intensive medical care with grants of $3,000. We're collecting and developing resources on our COVID-19 response page. We're going to be building a map of localized resources, um, grants that are very region specific so that people can have a quick access to those. Um, and we'll, we're also gonna be sharing creative ways that we have seen artists conduct careers online, whether it's through Instagram auctions or online exclusive shopping opportunities with their uh, community or online demonstrations or teaching. Lastly, we're gathering data, data and aggregating it with what's being collected by other organizations in the field about the impacts um, on the, of the virus so that we can be better advocates and better understand and meet your needs at this time. So visit surfplus.org to access these resources. Uh, there is also a get updates form on the bottom of every page of our website where you can sign up to get our communication so that we can notify you as additional resources become available. We're in this with you for the long haul and you can reach me at Carrie, C-A-R-R-I-E at surfplus.org. So thank you all so much for your time. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, that was amazing. And now Mark Rozier, I'm gonna invite you to share from the New York Foundation for the Arts. Uh, thank you, Anne-Marie. My name is Mark Rozier. I am the Director of Grants at the New York Foundation for the Arts, which is an organization that serves people of all artistic disciplines. So we spread a pretty wide net. Um, I have run a couple of emergency grant programs. So what I wanted to do today was just talk to you about some of the uh, things that would go into an application. Um, I have been on a number of calls, so I think there are going to be some opportunities coming along for artists in all disciplines. For the funding community understands the importance of this community of artists. And so I wanted to give you some tips of things to do before those things become available so you can be ready for them. Um, the first thing is read the guidelines. I know that Anne-Marie said that, I really can't say it enough. Um, every program may not support every discipline. Every program may not support every geographic region or financial situation. So save yourself time, read the guidelines. They're usually very clear, read the FAQs. And if you're not qualified, just move on and look for other opportunities. Don't, there's no point in emailing funders and saying, could I be an exception? Just move on. Um, the other thing is the import, it's really important to have documentation. Uh, people are very sympathetic when it comes to emergency grants, but they still need to make their decisions based on data and information. So use this time now to pull together as much information as you can. Uh, what funders will look like, look for varies. So again, you'll want to read the guidelines, but these are some of the things you should start compiling. Um, contracts or commitment letters stating the terms of the engagement, the dates, the rate of pay, and ideally, though not vital, would be a cancellation letter. I mean, obviously, if your state has canceled all activities, you're fine, but ideally, a cancellation letter. If you have a lot of this by email, that can be fine as well. Um, 
If you don't have these, take time now, write to people and ask if you can get them. Tell them there are opportunities for you and you would love to get it in writing. The other thing to remember is these don't have to be arts related activities. Most funders understand that artists don't make most of their living from their art. So if you have temp jobs that have fallen through, if you had catering jobs, teaching jobs, any of those things that you had that fell through, get the documentation for it. Anything that would have given you money, get documentation for so that you'll be ready to submit things. Um, the other thing is you want to have a strong history of your past activities. Um, you may have to sort of guesstimate how much you would have brought in on certain things, but you really wanna have back, backup for that. So for example, if you're a musician and you sell a lot of t-shirts and CDs, if people still make CDs, um, CDs at your concerts and you had concerts canceled, look back in your history and say, you know, what was a similar size venue in a similar geographic region and how much did you make from concert and t-shirt sales? And you want to keep a record of all of that so that if you say, I was supposed to perform a concert, the concert was canceled, here's how much I would have made, you have that as backup for it. And funders will find that and panelists will find that compelling and, and appropriate information because it's based on something real. Same goes for visual artists, the same goes for writers, if you sell books at events. Um, also, again, as Emery was saying, if you don't already have it, prepare an artist resume. Frequently on events like this, because you know there are people who are scammers and the question of what's an artist and who's an artist will come up. So have a resume, have a website, or you, know, you can use the narrative portion of the application to explain that. Now, these don't necessarily need to be things for which you're compensated. You know, if you're an actor and you were in four readings and you have a number of auditions, or maybe you have an agent or a casting director who's called you to read for things, um, those all demonstrate that you are active in the field. And that's what panels want to know, that you're an active participant in the field. Visual artists, you know, if you've had work in group shows, even if nothing has sold, that's fine. If you've been receiving grants, artist grants, that's fine. Press coverage is fine. Anything that sort of backs up your claim to be an artist. Now, I could go on, but I will stop here. Um, I will say that on our website, which is nyfa.org, nyfa.org, we have a full list of resources as well. I'm sure a lot of our websites have the same information, but we just want to make sure it's out in as many ways as possible. Uh, and now I'm going to go to Viviana for another Reflective Five. Thank you all. Thank you. Oh, this, is, this is really amazing. Um, yes, so another Reflective Five, taking in all the information we've gotten preparing, um, processing, and allowing to be continued to be filled um, with more great resources, solutions, um, yes. And uh, we'll be taking this moment to specifically uplift, center, hold space for Black freelance artists. Um, so we'll go ahead and inhale, one, two, three, four, five. Hold, five, four, three, two, one. Release, five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. Back Thank to you so much. Thanks, Viviana, I appreciate you. All right, um, I just wanna take a moment to say, while we're in this space of reflection, we've already heard so much great information. This webinar, broadcast, live cast, whatever it's called, is being recorded and will be shared online by HowlAround and on the COVID freelance resource website in the next 24 hours or so. And we hope to also be able to share a transcript. I know we are sharing a lot of information quickly, 
So don't worry, we are trying to, we got you. We're trying to collect as much of this information as we can for you. And we also just wanna take a moment to acknowledge that we know this crisis is moving quickly. The reality on the ground is changing rapidly. And we unfortunately are not equipped to answer specific questions about every community. Um, our site has been shared all over the world and we're really amazed by that, but we're not unfortunately equipped to answer specific questions. Um, at this point. However, we are getting a lot of questions about geographically specific need, specifically information about unemployment insurance, government assistance, grants. We wanna remind you again that you can look up your local arts council, which you can do by Googling your city or county and the words arts council and see what comes up and see if there is an emergency response. Um, and you know, remember that these are people experiencing crisis as well. So give it a few days if you can. And we are also trying to collect a lot of discipline and geographically specific information on our site and to share it as quickly as we can. We just heard from a number of institutions and formal 501c3 organizations, and we're really grateful for their presence today on the call. Now we wanna to turn to some ideas for funding and fundraising that are more grassroots and extra institutional, since these have the possibility to move more quickly and disperse funds in new and innovative ways. Of course, we can look to alternate earning screen streams to support us while this crisis is ongoing, including distance work like copy editing, photo retouching, building websites, social media marketing, moving our classes and workshops online, and doing non-arts work as we always do. We did speak about this earlier, and more resources about this are on our site, and hopefully we will have webinars and other information to share in the future. If you are in a truly crisis situation, you can also look at ways to use debt responsibly to mitigate this crisis, including low or no interest loans, asking to skip or defer student loans or mortgage payments, and stuff like that. We're gonna encourage you to be extremely cautious about using any kind of credit card or a high interest loan as it may compound an already precarious situation. But if this is an option, it is one to look into together with your bank or loan servicer for a short-term solution. If you have small business insurance or general liability insurance, you might look into the possibility that you can file a claim against your policy for lost business income or some kind of uh, help for business interruption. Some, but not all policies will include this type of coverage. But truly in the face of such a widespread crisis, we also wanna talk about community-based mutual aid solutions like the one that Ijoma Luo created in Seattle and which are being created all over the country. We have seen examples in Durham, North Carolina, Fort Worth, Texas, all over California, New York, and beyond. Some of them are discipline specific. Some serve populations that are experiencing this crisis in a more acute way. Members of the Asian American Pacific Islander community, queer people, black and indigenous people of color and immigrant communities. If you strongly identify with a community um, like this, these resources might be for you. This kind of community support has a long history going back hundreds of years actually in the form of giving circles and lending clubs, which are used today as a form of community-based insurance in Haiti, the Caribbean, India, and West Africa. In the United States, these mechanisms have moved online in the form of the GoFundMe campaign for personal costs in the wake of a family or medical crisis, and now disperse millions of dollars a year to people in need. And I'm so honored to get to invite um, Ijoma Luo from Seattle, a writer and activist, to talk to us a little bit about her experience 
um, with that with their crowdfunding. Hi, can you all hear me okay? Wonderful, okay. Um, I am Ijomo Luo, and I am a writer and speaker in the Seattle area. And we're kind of in the epicenter of this crisis right now. And we were hit hard for weeks. And I kind of noticed a couple of weeks ago, I was looking at my calendar as a speaker and noticing that um, I had everything for the next two months had been canceled and was feeling quite lucky that I could weather that financially. But my partner's a musician and a radio DJ. We're very, very close in the arts community. My brother's a musician as well. And we realized that this was going to hit our community incredibly hard. What we put together, I had had some previous experience in the community uh, putting together um, sort of impromptu campaigns to help out locally whenever we had issues. We had a huge snowfall that kept kids out of school for multiple weeks and we kind of put together lunch campaigns, things like that. But this was something I knew was going to be bigger. So right now it's a team of four of us. It's me, my assistant Ebony Arunga, who um, now that I don't have any speaking gigs, has been completely repurposed um, to work on this, and my partner Gabriel. And then we have partnered with a local theater group, the Langston Hughes um, Literary and um, Langston Hughes Theater Art Center, and. It has been an amazing and frustrating experience. Um, A couple of the things that have been really great about this. um, One is when you're connected to the community, it's very easy for community to reach out to you. So a lot of the outreach as far as letting people know this is available is already done within your network. Once you state and putting together funds, then um, people who support the arts and people who our artists are already kind of connected to you in a way um, that really takes a lot of that PR work out of it. And for me as a black woman, a black queer uh, person in the arts, um, it was really important to me that this wasn't just a people who are really close to the industry who have access. And oftentimes people who know to apply for certain grants are people who have a a particular type of access that people from, traditionally underrepresented or marginalized communities do not. So we were able to set this up. We set up a GoFundMe and we use um, a survey monkey for people to apply. Um, A couple of things I would say if you are um, interested in starting one of your own is try to get as much information as you can from the applicants. because there have been definite um, groups have reached out to us saying, we have funding that's specific to LGBTQ people. Can we give that to you for your LGBTQ applicants? Uh, Things like that, if you already have that data, it makes it a lot easier to have those conversations. Um, We take the applications and we work out a formula based on how much money we have. So we've set a minimum that we can give and a maximum we can give. And we look at the group of um, applications we have and what percentage of the requests we can afford to pay out. It's not percentages in how many people, but percentage of what was requested. Uh, We are seeing requests from anywhere from $50 to, you know, $15,000. Some of our really big festivals were canceled and artists are out a lot of money. And we are really looking at what we can pay that's meaningful, uh, but also ensures that we can help as many people as possible. Um, So far, we've been really lucky in that we've been able to partner with uh, local nonprofits like Langston, and they've been able to help us with our payments, Uh, PayPal, is not a good partner for this sort of work at all. It's been an actual nightmare. We had tens of thousands of dollars locked up in PayPal for almost uh, a week uh, because they their scam alerts set off when we started sending money out to people and we were unable to touch it. So partnering with um, a nonprofit that already has a, um, a mechanism to send money out is really important. It's also really important that we be transparent if you're going to do this sort of um, community fundraising. So while I feel like I am a trusted member of the community, I am the reach of this project is far beyond 
people I know and the funding grows and grows and grows and the partnerships grow. And so what we've done to stay accountable is we are, we've brought in accountability partners. So we've brought in people from industry and people from the arts who agree to look at information redacted, like, you know, no names um, in from, of where the money is coming in and where it's going out to oversee that process so that we can provide regular um, reporting on demand to people who want to know where the money's going to. We're also very, you know, careful to make sure that we are taking care of and really representing the needs of marginalized artists. So we really are focusing on getting the words out to our um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, disabled artists, um, and our queer and trans artists and non-binary artists and making sure that they can apply. And we're also making sure that everyone knows this is a fully intersectional approach. Um, and when it comes to who gets, you know, time and um, money from us, it's been a huge project. It's taken up a lot of my time, a lot of my whole team's time, but we're really grateful for it. It's also been really great because a lot of nonprofits um, and government groups that can't immediately disperse funds are able to grant us and we can disperse funds. And so I've heard from a lot of people who work at these larger foundations who are really frustrated that they can't just immediately start cutting checks because they know the urgency of it. But also this means that right now we're also setting up meetings with how do we transition towards longer term assistance. Here in Seattle, we are looking at likely at least eight weeks of you know, sheltering in place pretty much. This means that we're going to need more than what just emergency assistance can provide. But I will say that this is an amazing opportunity as artists and activists for us to look at what community means, for us to look at how we support the arts, how our cities support the arts, and look at, you know, how we work together. We're finding new ways to bring the arts to people. We're trying as creators to also model arts in a world where we're being responsible and um, kind of keeping ourselves at home. What does it look like? What does social distancing look like in a social world? I feel like as artists, we can show that with our work. So we are doing fundraisers. Um, we're planning a fundraiser that's going to be like an online telethon and people are recording their performances. And we're gonna have, you know, um, announcers talking about it, raising funds and people can log in online and see what's happening. And we can keep people connected, keep the arts alive in our city and also continue um, to fund artists. So it's been a really difficult time and it's been a beautiful time. And I hope that we can all use this to look at how we connect to each other and look at how we um, keep each other together for the long term and work with our agencies, work with our theater groups so that we can really all hold each other up. We're really hoping that in Seattle, we can be a model for this, um, not only in how we get through crisis, but really how we transform through crisis. And that's really our goal is to transform away from a hyper-capitalist system that really crushes um, people of color, trans people, non-binary people, queer people, disabled people, um, at the moment that there's any sort of trouble and one that instead upholds and you know fully is shaped by these populations as well. And so that's really what we're looking for. We're pairing with our libraries, we're pairing with our theater groups, we're pairing with our city, we're pairing with our arts groups. And using the flexibility we have and the experience we have on the ground to do that. So I encourage anyone who wants to look at the language we have, the setup we have, and wants to copy it. I get emails, 20 emails a day asking if people can copy that. Please feel free. Copy it. Copy it for your for your uh, group. Copy it but not only for gig workers, but also looking at the other industries that gig workers often work at. So, so many gig workers also work at the restaurants that are closing, you know, and things like that. So what can we do in these spaces? If we all work together, I think we can um, really transform our communities. As horrible as the situation is, I think we can transform our communities for the better. Thanks. What? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I got to keep my shit together. Amy. Woo -hoo. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Let's go on to you, if we can. Okay. Whew. Wow, I'm so grateful to be here. I'm Amy Smith. I'm a dance and theater artist uh, based in Philadelphia, educator and facilitator as well. Um, I want to start with a quote from Grace Lee Boggs, who said, every crisis, actual or impending, needs to be viewed as an opportunity to bring about profound changes in our society. Going beyond protest organizing, visionary organizing begins by creating images and stories of the future that help us imagine and create alternatives to the existing system. So that's from her book, The Next American Revolution, Sustainable Activism for the 21st Century. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some financial well-being that we can be thinking about as we deal with this pandemic. And I want to start by saying, you are not alone. Many of us feel embarrassed to talk about financial vulnerability because neoliberal capitalism tells us that we should be climbing a ladder toward financial success and that our success and failures are indicative of individual strength or weakness. But your debt is not shameful. Your financial reality is not shameful. It is not of your making. The system was designed to funnel wealth toward the owning class, and it is working exactly as it was designed. Capitalism, patriarchy, colonialism, and white supremacy all work together to ensure the flow of wealth into the hands of white people in the owning class. No amount of individual knowledge or strength or perseverance guarantees upward mobility. But I believe that we can share resources and form coalitions to achieve more personal family and community well being. I hope that this pandemic can move us closer to humane policies from our government and more robust structures of mutual aid. There is some deep stuff getting in the way of our financial well being beyond the structural oppression. One is imposter syndrome or as the woman who coined that phrase wishes she'd called it, imposter experience. Imposter experience makes us doubt our accomplishments and creates a persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud or not belonging. The other thing getting in the way of our financial well-being is scarcity mentality. Scarcity mentality is zero sum thinking. It's the belief that there will never be enough. It's short-term thinking over long-term thinking. If we can learn to recognize the patterns of scarcity mentality in ourselves and others, we can start to move toward healthier attitudes and more collective power. In a time of crisis, I'm not sure we can realistically move towards abundance thinking, but we do need to be asking what is enough and make sure that we share resources so that everyone has enough and survives together. Scarcity mentality is bad for our mental health because it makes us jealous and competitive. And it's bad for our financial health because it encourages us to make short-term decisions that have a negative effect on our long-term financial health. Scarcity mentality also leads to power hoarding, which is one of the aspects of white supremacy culture identified by Tima Okun and Kenneth, Kenneth Jones in their article of that name. Power hoarding is seeing little value around sharing power. Power is seen as limited with only so much to go around. This is quoting from the article. Those with power feel threatened when anyone suggests changes in how things should be done. Those with power assume they have the best interests of the organization at heart and assume those wanting change are ill-informed, emotional, inexperienced. This attitude is very familiar to me, having run a nonprofit arts organization for 25 years and from the countless stories I've heard doing tax prep for hundreds of artists over the years. You can substitute the word power with the word wealth and you have a perfect description of the nonprofit industrial complex. This thinking is hurting us individually and preventing us from coming together to solve our collective problems. Even before this pandemic, 40% of people in the United States did not have $400 in the bank to cover an emergency. 
When you don't have an emergency fund, you cannot survive unexpected losses of income like many of us are experiencing right now. Personal finance experts recommend having three to six months worth of expenses in a savings account, money market, or other steady account. But in my experience, that's pretty hard for most low income and working class artists to achieve. So I always recommend one to three months worth of expenses. The trick is to do this, you have to start saving before you have paid down debt, which feels somehow wrong because of what our culture tells us about debt being shameful. So once we get through this current crisis, plan for the next one by slowly building up an emergency fund. And while we're in this crisis, we need to do some redistribution of wealth inside our arts communities and local communities to fill the gaps of government programs and provide assistance to those most vulnerable. And just to be clear, those most vulnerable are Black, Indigenous, people of color, trans artists, undocumented artists, and artists with disabilities. We who have class privilege need to put our money where our mouth is now. Let's talk about safety nets. There's nothing wrong with having a safety net and no shame in using a safety net if you have one. We are in a crisis and now is the time to use that safety net. If you can access them, access Medicaid and SNAP, AKA food stamps and other government safety net programs. If you have a family safety net and you have resource to share, share those resources with others in your circles. I inherited some money when my grandfather died several years ago and my practice since then has been a practice of personal reparations. I'm trying to give away money in direct proportion to my white privilege and unearned wealth. This has happened for me in two ways, 0% interest loans to a black person so they have a down payment to buy a house and a trans person to go to nursing school and periodically just Venmoing a black former student who is food insecure and an undocumented former student who needs help making rent. There are also a bunch of community funds and mutual aid maps being set up in response to this pandemic, some of which we've heard about tonight. And it's great that so many artists are contributing and it's also great to reach out to those funds if you need the support. Collectives. I am so inspired by people who formed collectives to address community needs, like mutual aid societies. The Free African Society was founded right here in Philadelphia in 1787 by Richard Allen and Absalom Jones, which morphed into insurance companies, credit unions, trade unions, and co-working spaces. Cooperatives like Fannie Lou Hamer's Freedom Farm Cooperative, community land trusts, many of which were founded during the civil rights movement and still exist today, artist collectives, and the Jubilee movement. Individual artists can and should come together to build collectives to help us survive this moment, but I also call on institutions to come together. We have five Lord Theaters in Philadelphia. What if all five EDs came together to brainstorm how to support the whole community of theater artists? Another suggestion I'll make is to use debt wisely. If you have a credit card, call them now to ask for a lower interest rate or see if you can get one of those cards with a 0% rate for six months or a year and use it to pay down cards with a higher APR. If you own a home, take advantage of these historically low interest rates to get a home equity loan or refinance your mortgage to pay down other debt. If you have a student loan debt, ask for a deferment or sign up for income-based repayment or debt consolidation and consider declaring bankruptcy. It is nothing to be ashamed of. It's a smart move if you are overwhelmed with debt. I wanna put in a caveat that if you work with a credit counseling agency, make sure it is a nonprofit credit counseling agency. NFCC.org is a good place to start and or you can go to the resources pages of my website, which is amyelainesmith.com for more resources. All debt is negotiable. Many low-income artists don't realize that lenders have all budgeted for writing off bad debt. Call your lenders, 
tell them you've lost income due to the coronavirus and ask them to write off a portion of your debt, lower your APR, or give you other relief. I would love to schedule a future conversation so that we can go deeper into these topics and also talk about issues like valuing your time, negotiating for fair pay, advocating for and establishing equal pay policies, budgeting, financial goal setting. But for now, navigating these uncertain times, I mostly just want to underline, do not be ashamed, ashamed. Use this time to reflect and plan and find opportunities to form collective bonds that will last long after this crisis has passed. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Nicole. Thank you so much, Amy. Oh. So I wanna do um, the last of our reflective fives and I'm gonna name out some, um, some populations and some communities that we wanna hold up. Parents and caregivers, those freelance artists neurodiverse freelancers, and freelance artists over the age of 65. And so we'll do our reflective five, inhale in, one, two, three, four, five, hold, five, four, three, two, one, release, one, two, three, four, five. Great, I want to turn it over to Abigail, I believe. Abigail Vega! Yes. Wonderful. <sighs> Folks, thank you so much for hanging in with us. We have heard so, so much amazing information tonight and we're grateful uh, to all of the inspiring folks who are on this call. Um, I'm here to be the bearer of bad news. We unfortunately won't have time on this uh, panel to answer specific questions, but we have been collecting them. We're gonna be getting those questions to the right people via email, and then we'll be tweeting out their, their kind of bite-sized responses to them and, and helping to direct y'all to some other resources. Um, we will try to go where the heat is and explore and answer the questions that uh, keep coming up in some form or another. Um, but we did receive some questions that are very basic, things like, where can I find resources to help me financially in my specific city or state? Or will you be listing resources that will help me financially? And the answer is yes. Our community here in the United States and abroad has been so, so generous with creating and sharing resources to provide for the freelance community. And because there's so many, it would not be a good use of our time to verbally list them here. So we're going to encourage you to visit COVID-19 Freelance Artist Resource dot WordPress dot com. That's COVID-19 Freelance Artist Resource dot WordPress dot com to find literally hundreds hundreds of resources sorted by topics, including uh, mental health and health needs, advocacy, financial needs, remote job opportunities, and interrupting racism and bias, among many others. So if you need a resource, check here. Check your local arts councils and check here first. And if you have a resource to share, please let us know by submitting it online via our very quick um, Google form online um, on that resource list. Hundreds of people have already done so in the last three days, so you can too. Um, we wanna draw your attention to a few resources that did catch our eyes. Um, these will also be tweeted out by HowlRound. So will the COVID-19 website again. These include arts administrators of colors, GoFundMe to support black indigenous people of color, individual artists and arts administrators. Um, you can find that at aacnetwork.org. Um, Amita Swadin's GoFundMe is called uh, COVID-19 Mutual Aid Fund for LGBTQI plus 
BIPOC folks. So um, that's a big one. And if you want to apply for those funds, they're closing the application for it tomorrow. So we will be tweeting that out as well. We also want to draw attention to the Chicago Artist Relief Fund on GoFundMe and the Indie, and the Indie Theater Fund Rapid Relief Emergency Fund. Um, we know that tonight we barely scratched the surface of some larger conversations. This is an emerging project. <laughs> so we have been listening to the community to dictate our next steps. That being said, we've heard uh, some calls for future conversations. So right now we've outlined some panels that we'll be putting together over the next few days and weeks. Um, one on interrupting bias and racism in our heightened environment. Um, and that is hopefully gonna be co-hosted with National Performance Network. Number two, reimagining how we gather, thinking about how we can come together at this time with Brian Joseph Lee and a TBA celebrity guest to be announced shortly. Uh, financial literacy and planning for individual artists with Amy Smith, hopefully. And then uh, another one around families, how artists with families can weather this COVID-19 crisis with Rachel Spencer Hewitt and the Parent Artist Advocacy League. So if you had questions that felt like they were inside of any of those four categories, like stay tuned. The best way to keep up to date with these resources is of course, follow the website that Amory is holding up right now COVID-19 freelance artist resource at .wordpress.com, but also sign up for HowlRound's mailing list and follow them on Twitter at HowlRound. We, the producers of this call, don't have a structure in place to email you once these conversations get scheduled, but HowlRound does. So take advantage of that resource. Sign up. It's painless. It's quick and stay informed. The transcript for this call will be available in about three days and video recording of this call will be available within 24 hours on the same um, HowlRound post that you're currently watching this on. If you have friends who need to see this, direct them to this page within 24 hours, it'll be there. Okay, I've said a lot, so I'm now gonna turn it back over to Nicole and Viviana. Beautiful, I just love the way we're getting that website up there. Boop! Um, yeah, all right, Viv. Yes, um, so we're reaching the end and um, I just wanted to reflect, have us all kind of reflect back to the original intentions you may have set for this call for these hours um, together, things you want to take with us into this new, um, into this time and things you wanted to let go of. Um, and so I also wanted to now invite us beyond this call to do the same. Um, I would love for you to answer the question with yourself, with your community. What are you ready to let go of going into this new time, into this new season um, challenge? And what would you like to be poured into you? Great. Um, yeah. So handing it over to the producers for final words. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Viv. Great. <laughs> All right. Okay, great. So I will take the lead on that. There's a bunch of silence, you know? <laughs> I think I forgot I was facilitating. I'm so full. Um, just very briefly, I want to say, listen, this started with an idea uh, for me on Wednesday. And that idea did not just start on its own. It came from me listening to the Healing Justice podcast that had done an episode around um, disabled people like mobilizing and also doing uh, a four hour webinar to um, share resources. And just it later in the day, I was like, why can't we do that as freelance artists? Um, and so I'm so grateful to one, my art equity community who was able to drop in a request around, was anybody else thinking this way? Um, this, and I just, I'm saying this because this started out of me wanting to be in community with folks. It started with me wanting to collaborate with people. It started because my beloved community in the United States is an invisibilized community, even though they're beautiful and they're gorgeous and they're wonderful. So um, we're like transitioning to talk about something that's quite shameful and is used as Amy was talking about as a system of oppression, which is money. Um, 
So I just kind of want to turn this over, Anne Marie, to you. Oh, yeah, thank maybe. you so much. Okay. Um, tell me what I'm supposed to do right now. So I'm, I just got overwhelmed. We got a little script, y'all. We got a little script. Thank you. Yeah. Under closing thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Start with Nicole. <laughs> yeah, it's back. Am I doing filler or are you just Hey, want to no. Okay. Um, well, this, uh, so sorry, I got lost. Um, well, this is a labor of love for all of us. Creating and maintaining the resource list is actually work. Mm -hmm. We're so proud of our community for stepping up to help each other. And because of that, there has been so much uh, to take care of and manage. Uh, so if you would like to contribute a dollar or $3 towards this effort, as well as the continued efforts of maintaining the resource list online, you can Venmo funds directly to at C O V one nine dash F A R. That's at Cove 19 dash far. The name associated is uh, our call producer, Abigail Vega. And, um, we just want to back up just a minute to give some framework for that ask. Um, one of the things we've all been learning in real time over the past few days is just how fraught conversations about money can be. And Nicole just brought that up and how often we're not having them to avoid embarrassment, shame and feelings of unworthiness, which Amy talked about. Um, so we're really hoping that tonight we all made some steps towards undoing the unlearning of that social programming. Um, the work you all are doing as individual artists in service of your communities, in service of this world is valuable and you deserve to be paid for it. Yeah. Period. So, <laughs> one thing we also wanna say um, as we close out is that HowlRound has been a wonderful partner in all of this. They've provided the platform uh, for this to happen this evening, funds for the ASL interpreters, as well as some base support for freelance artists who facilitated tonight. And we're also grateful that they are a committed partner as we move forward with, a, with future live stream conversations. So again, if you wanna be a part of the next one that's a little bit more specific, follow HowlRound. The funds that anything that comes out of tonight is not going to HowlRound. It will be split equitably among the, uh, according to need among some of the freelance unaffiliated facilitators and producers for this. So tonight on the resource site, you will see a link to our list of funds raised, um, who they went to, how much is being paid out, 100% transparency. And as such, we'll be closing down the Venmo at 9 p.m. Eastern tomorrow night, March 17th. So it's only open for 24 hours. This isn't some attempt to like, keep it going. Don't stress if you cannot give. We're all in this together. Following instructions. I don't know if you can see that. Right. Yep, I see it. I love it. I'm going to go ahead and close this out. I'm, I'm literally fighting the shame in my body right now around this ask. And I only say that because I know that other people feel, feel this, this shame around the work that we do. Because we've been so ingrained, like ingrained in this work, folks, I've not, I've personally not been able to apply for any emergency resources because I've been tending to the beloved, beloved community. So I also kind of just want to put that out there as the work that we're doing. It's literally, folks have been working 12 hours uh, since this came up on Wednesday to make it happen for you. I hope we were useful. I hope. I mean, I feel full. I want to thank all of our guests. I want to thank HowlRound. I want to thank everybody who showed up and gave their time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Anybody else wanna say anything? Yeah, just a couple more things to close us out. Um, okay. So the most important thing we wanna drill down on, you are not alone. So tonight we had at least 700 people, if not many more watching this webinar. We gotta compile all the stats and let you know. Um, so keep organizing, keep connecting, and let's hold each other during this time from a distance, of course. Um, and a reminder that you can watch a recording of this panel on HowlRound.com starting tomorrow and get on HowlRound's mailing list so you can hear about future conversations um, led by this group and our fantastic network of geniuses. Thank you so much. Take care of yourselves. And we'll Thank talk you all. Good night. Take care. Bye. I love you.
Thank you.